It is March the 16th, 2024, and this is the future of photography. I, the future of photography. Wow, talking about a botched beginning to this episode. It is another episode. I'm Chris, we have Jeremiah, and uh, Adrian's not here. He's we, on. I, he's on location. He's we, on on reporting duty. We promised uh, to have him back, but what we both didn't have on our radar was that it's the photography show up in Manchester right now in the UK. Well, yeah. Big. He's big. reporting. He's going to report back next week on all of the yes. newest gear and the most fun things that he's discovered there. Absolutely. So uh, we're looking forward to that. Until then, we also want to dig into some of the news around, well, photography and other things. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the, okay, three items that we have uh, pulled together. The first one is one of, it, it's important to me because it has defined um, a lot of what I do over the last 17 years. So I, I could say it has a certain level of importance, even though it's not strictly about photography. Um, it is the birthday, I think the 25th birthday of RSS. Yay, RSS. So what is RSS? <clears throat> exactly. Thanks for the question. <laughs> <laughs> RSS is um, what makes it possible for you out there to listen to this pretty much. Um, RSS stands for Really Simple Syndication. It is a protocol that had its specification released 15 years ago on March the 15th in 1999, and it has enabled podcasting. It has enabled uh, automated content aggregation, customized news feeds, uh, real-time notifications, content syndication, of course, podcast distribution. What um, That happened about 18 years ago. 17 to 18 years ago, um, someone extended the RSS specification to add media, as in audio files, video files, and so on. Because it to, used to be used for chat rooms and that kind of thing way back when. Well, what um, a version of it. What, what really, what, uh, we, uh, we, I, I think we really have to emphasize how revolutionary that was because up to that point there was a web there were blogs and so on but there was you you had to have a list of places to visit and go a check for your news and click on this and click on that and then all of a sudden there was a, a standardized way to receive these informations a new blog entry a new entry on a news feed would would just show up in your news reader. That was a category of apps, so they would they would periodically go out to all the things you subscribe to and pull and look if their RSS feeds had a new item in it. And then podcasting was just an extension of that pretty much. So you had a pod catcher or podcast client or podcast player um, that you would subscribe to your um, podcast in and then... In the background, this RSS thing uh, was the specification, and it still is in case of many podcasts. Um, now, <laughs> we do have a bit of a different situation now, 18 years later, because um, there are platforms now who want to uh, be the, the, the main player in the podcast field, as in Spotify and so on. And they have their own protocols and they have their own things. But the open podcasting environment, the open podcast uh, system is based on RSS and whoever has an RSS feed uh, can be subscribed to in. Now, how does that affect players. photography? Well, it affects photography in one important way. I would never have started a photography podcast if it wasn't for RSS. That was no. the, 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 that kick-started podcasting. Is there a a equivalent? I'm asking this kind of as a fan base. Um, is there equivalent for one or many to subscribe simply to images? Yes. Now, and is it a cousin of RSS? Yes, it is. So, so what we have is um, well, first of all, we have we still have blogs. If you go to let's say your favorite 
photography news site Petapixel or something like that, they are they have an RSS feed and there are blogs that are strictly about photography and those also have an RSS feed so you can subscribe like Word to Pre new like photography. WordPress WordPress mm -hmm. is the is the the vehicle that many of these blogs run on and WordPress has an RSS feed it's built on that pretty much yeah. and then there are also newer uh, incarnations when we talk about Mastodon and what we call the Fediverse the federated universe of things there's something called pixel fed which is kind of an open variation of instagram which it, <laughs> instagram isn't really a photography site anymore it used to be uh now it's more a branding kind of a deal but uh, pixel fed is emerging right now as a as an alternative to something like instagram and that mm -hmm. comes with its own open protocol to access things and that's a cousin of rss wouldn't you say that uh, one of the, the the drawbacks and benefits of these kinds of things are network uh, adoption? So they are valuable only with network adoption. Yes. Yeah, the the network effect is 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 important critical. for those. Yeah, yes. it's critical. It's critical. We, it won't work without right. enough people using. So that. you know, you know, we go to the fax machine, you know, uh, metaphor where you know, if you have one fax machine, it's not going to yep. do you a hell of a lot of good. You need at least two to make it worthwhile, so you can exchange documents. And of course, the more people that have it, the better it is. And of course, that gets replaced by yeah. the internet, etc. But. Um, is there a benefit to narrowing one's gaze at subscription um, interests? So, for example, you know, I'm a user daily, probably of Instagram, uh, less so with others. Um, and, and I find that um, the way I use Instagram is more of a inspired gallery walk in some kinds of because of the people or institutions that I follow they're generally art photography a create creative related of course I get a lot of adjunct um, offerings around that more and more every year and that I, I don't subscribe to people showing me what they had for dinner last night um, unless it was Martin Parr or something like that. Does he do that? <laughs> uh, but 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 um as we I kind of as we move forward, you know, one is often overwhelmed by, you know, mediocrity, um, depending on how one filters all of these things. And I was always curious about the effect on those who are looking for the random inspiration of the crowd wisdom of whatever they're doing um, to narrowly define one's interest, not to create a bubble because that, that I think is not helpful for inspiration. It's always nice to be outside of the bubble and yet being reinforced by the things that reinforce you and your aesthetic and approach. So I, I wonder if AI uh, will contribute to a new form of syndicated um, broadcast, webcast, podcast, visual cast, whatever you want to call it. And one is able to train a personal GPT or personal AI, a small model, um, to um, amass on a daily basis a global inspired um I, I i guess random organized um group of images that are personalized and yet randomized um because we haven't seen that yet um and and i think that that probably um, if, if we're talking about the future <laughs> here i think that that is the next step in this kind of approach like, for example, if I hear about a great podcast, I'll make a note of it. I'll, I happen to use Castro 
sometimes, <laughs> yeah. you know, which I like, which may be doddering on its last legs or reinventing itself. It's, I can't tell. It's, it's, it's been, it's, it, it has found its, its new okay, owner. Yeah. And yeah. We're, we're, we're <laughs> it's stable. Looking forward to it. Uh, there were a few crazy weeks uh, about a couple of months ago <laughs> that I was like, oh God. I have to so, <laughs> but so let me, let me, let, let me, let me try to, to, um, uh, to answer that, because I, I think what we have is we have RSS as a vehicle, a technical vehicle uh, yeah. under underneath it, even though people do not really often really don't care what the vehicle is that helps them subscribe to things. And um, there used to be aggregators, as in websites, portals who would um, who would allow you to subscribe to interesting things. Um, there was something along that line, along those lines, yeah. on the podcasting side. As in, you could have yeah. you could you could subscribe to a new podcast feed that would aggregate other podcasts. And if you find a vehicle, and that could be AI, um, to to do that curation for you, that should. Honestly, probably be possible now, especially as we have as we have the 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 machinery to do uh, voice recognition, transcription, and so on. So content analysis, and then uh, based on that, doing recommendations and build you build build your your specify your your specific very very well curated um, podcast RSS feed should be possible. I'll give you an example of of kind of the where where I approach this, at least conceptually. Um, I go to a gallery, um, an art gallery. The curation of that gallery is generally by an individual, usually an, a, an absolute single person. Uh, in a museum, it may be a board um, that has a lot to do with the um, curation. Um, but if I go to Freeze or, or you know, a Biennale, there's a, a group, a ma you know, a mass of stuff uh, of which maybe 10 or 15% of which I really like. So, you know, I'm, and that is what I consider more aggregated by who's paying to be in those art um, markets, call, call it. Is there something coming that is in between? So, for example, I would like to go to a virtual freeze, but every single aggregation is more or less what it is that addresses, based on my own history, my own likes, my own work, that is either completely counter to what I'm seeing or an adjunct to what I'm seeing, and it hits on a say an eighty percent basis, rather than the individual aggregation, which there Colossus or Colo uh, what's that site Colossal, which aggregates you yeah. know graphics and photography and stuff like that. We are seeing something along those lines in uh, one of those social media sites right now which is called blue sky have you I, do you have a blue sky account i don't um, so when it came online i i missed out so I well it's open now so, you, yeah. so so it, it it is it is open and, and available to everyone and they have okay when you go to I don't know. Let's say Twitter or something. You have the algorithm that gives you your home feed, and that mm. that does sort of a curation for you. Of course, you don't know the algorithm. You don't know what's behind it, how it does it, why it chooses what it chooses, and so on. And that's, that's a bit, what a I'm bit of the at. problem yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, in Blue Sky, you can subscribe to what they call feeds. So you can subscribe to different kinds of algorithms for. Um, for curation, so um, and these can be built by everyone. A bit technical right now, but there's a lot of like different kinds of things that that might be topical, as in a science feed, or uh, it might be a for you feed that would um, get the permission to analyze what you're looking at, what you're interested in, and build that curation based on that. There's the I don't know a week peak feed which brings up the 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 top things that that had the most likes in the week uh, or uh, 
uh, or your your best running one so you can have one that gives you like a list of the ones of your own posts that had the most likes and so on so how that is that is, different from Mastodon, for example? Well, it's an interesting model. Of which I've it, had a terrible experience on. Uh, and, yeah, but that, that's, I know, I know, it's possible that <laughs> that can happen. But how is that different? It is different because you as the user um, decides which of those feeds to describe to and the, uh, subscribe to, and these feeds are made by users. So you can, um, you have a choice of, tens of thousands of different kinds of feeds for specific purposes and um you are you do not get a like no no one forces anything on you it's your choice as is with rss you subscribe to whatever you want to subscribe to in this case it's an it's an it's a semi automated thing behind a feed that uh, creates that curation for you so so anyway uh I think we've pointed out the you know the major um, issue in the consumption of media culture, which is how do we filter it? How do we get what we oh, like? That's and yet, the difficult side now. Yeah, yeah. Of, course, of course. In other words, how do we get what we like? How do we trust where it's coming from? How do we get stuff that is outside of our expectations, which is very important because if we're just seeing supportive, whether it's aesthetics or news. It just reinforces a cloud or a bubble around our point of view, which is one of the problems in our, you know, in our politics here in the U.S. But um, I think that I am always looking for random versus supportive in the kinds of media or aesthetics that um, involve me, because that keeps me inspired and informed. And I, I think we're not there yet in achieving that balance. No, but um, I th I think with the progression of what came out of RSS, uh, I think we have a chance of getting to a certain point. So anyway, happy birthday RSS! It has birthday. kicked off. It has kicked off a, a wave of. We are talking about millions of podcasts right now that wouldn't yeah. be possible without it. Second news item: Last week we talked about Nikon buying Red. This week we have to talk about lens rentals buying borrow lenses. Which I don't know how much does that does does that touch you in in the in the field of movie production? No, not really. Not really. Not really, right? not really but but uh, and and because I'm <laughs> I currently am using a fixed lens camera. <laughs> oh, you affect, yeah. It doesn't so, affect me at all. But on my other cameras, yes, right. I have used these. Um, I have used. Uh, I forget which. I haven't used borrow lenses. I forget the the one that I did use and had a terrific experience right. of, you know, they were very organized. The lens kept, it came on time. It was packed right. I used it. And it's, they're usually specialty lenses, like, you know, a 600 millimeter lens that, you know, you wouldn't go out and purchase or, you know, unless that was your stock and trade. But I think that uh, lens rentals are certainly the kinds of things that do exist um, by nature in film. That's the normal. In other words, you know, you go to a, you know, a Panavision and you rent your cameras. And sometimes those cameras are owned by individuals um, and serviced and managed uh, by these big companies and they lend them out because you want these cameras working all the time. Right. <clears throat> so it's very rare that you come into a situation in a film where you aren't renting equipment that is a line item budget. And it's often discussed right. <laughs> because the DP wants every lens, every, you know, everything and multiple bodies, everything. And then you, and the same thing with lighting. Um, so, but in still photography, uh, there has been, you know, probably half a dozen of these that are, um, that are really useful for individuals. And, um, I think if everyone was considering buying a specialty lens, um, one would be really well served by renting it first and really putting right. it through the paces and seeing, uh, what the up and the downside of those lenses are before purchasing. 
Yeah, for me, for me, the, the the biggest touch point was usually on on photo tours where participants would come with a really big, expensive lens, and they would have rented that for a week or something. Uh, if you look at rens, lens, lensrentals.com's website, they seem to also start to cater to more professional film production. They have an Arri Alexa here that you can rent, um, but they are they they would um, typically. Or originally catered to still photographers, they'd have cameras, they'd have lenses, and so on. And we see some consolidation now, as in lens rentals being probably, um, if not the largest, among the really large ones. Sure. Um, buying borrow lenses, a San Francisco-based uh, company, yeah. who are now who've now closed their doors, and uh, lens rentals is taking over their assets, their customers, and a part of their employees, but not like the physical empl- uh, location that is I mean, closed. you know, here in LA, it's a little bit different because we have, you know, we have Sammy's here, for example, and mm-hmm. you can rent, you know, a plethora of gear there, just right. kind of roll up and, you know, go to the service counter, they'll give you the camera and you bring it back whenever. Um, I, you know, did a, a, a photo shoot a couple of years ago um, in Joshua Tree, and I rented a very high-end Hasselblad, um, you know, um, digital. And these cameras can be fifty, sixty thousand dollars. I mean, they're extremely expensive, very high quality. But you know, I'm not going to buy one of those. But to rent it for, and I worked it out so it was a three-day rental around a holiday, so I got it for five days, and sure. it, it, you know, it, it it wasn't cheap. You know, it probably cost me, I don't know, four or $500 for five days, which, you know, $100 a day, that's okay for a $60,000 camera. But I managed to use it, learn it, um, and take photographs, and that became part of a, a, of a show. I then returned it happily and was very, very um, happy that I did that. Now, if I was a professional, by the way, in a studio working on product shots every day, it would probably behoove me to own it because I could pass that on to my clients. Here's, here's also one aspect that um, I, I, I'm sure doesn't doesn't work for everyone or count for everyone, but um, I have found in the past that it was really, really beneficial in some situations to know that equipment in and out, to have spent months with a camera. Um, I, I, I had situations where I had to operate a camera in the dark and upside down, literally. Yeah. Sure. So it was, it, it was. I, w- I couldn't have taken pictures with a camera that I only knew for a few days. So um, I, I agree with that. That is an um, aspect which doesn't, again, doesn't uh, hold true for everyone because some people are really quick on their feet, uh, but some people will need a longer to sure. get and acquainted. Sure, and I, I would say that that is certainly more and more true as engineers have a, um, a much louder... Um, voice in the design of these cameras so for example well they do and i i manifest it by the difference between say a sony a still camera let's just call a sony still camera and uh, and a leica you know, just just for comparison yeah not quality you know on a sony i have to spend a lot of time learning the menu and and by the way, on the Hasselblad, before I rented it, I went online and I watched every video and I really drilled down on what to the, expect. You are certainly the type of person who will probably be quick in learning a new camera. But there is, but to spend the time learning menus, which are buried in other menus, buried in other menus, as opposed to the analog feel of something which I think the body can learn much faster, is a, I believe, a big design flaw of today's cameras. Isn't it interesting? Because we we do have areas where we used to be, like where some standardization had taken place place as in cars for example they have a a wheel i mean things are changing now but they have a wheel they have a, a couple of pedals they have some buttons that they have there is a standardized like iconography in cars you have to have the the i don't know the the emergency lights button has to say x y and z it has to be that size and so on so there's standardization going on just imagine that 
with cameras because the only thing that makes cameras kind of standardized is they have a shutter button and a place to to put your put towards your eye and another place to point towards your your subject that's all well, that, right no that's that's true and it, it's funny because um you know having i've been driving my my wife's tesla <laughs> uh over the last couple of Th weeks that's why i said it's changing good and and i have to say and then and i'm going to say that i i love driving the tesla um but Every time I have to do something, there's this menu. But like, you know, I, I wanted to wash the windshields and like, you know, hit the park. <laughs> right? You know, you know, you know that within the next year, probably most bigger car manufacturers will have large language models included. So you will be discussing things with your car. You might You'll have just, a back and forth about what the ideal speed for your windshield wiper is. Well, yes, I I look forward to that <laughs> rather than reading a menu in very small type while driving sixty miles an hour. Well, no, then the conversation goes. Do you have a windshield wiper? A windshield wiper? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Would you like me to turn it on? Anyway, rentals. Going back to yeah. the the thing, I, I think rentals are a great way of learning a lens, a camera, or any kind of, um, you know, any yeah. kind of object that you don't want to immediately make an investment in. But to your point, to take a rental camera and put it in a ground war of, of intensity, I think is not, th that's not the way you learn the camera. You no. have to learn it slowly and deliberately. I was doing landscape photography on tripods, so it you was- You have plenty of time. You have plenty, plenty of, time of time to time make to mistakes. <laughs> uh, you know, if I screwed up and missed the light, I would come back the next morning. So there, there was a way of doing it. But if I had to take that into a- you know, a situation that was sort of one of a kind, something that was happening immediately on the street, things that couldn't be duplicated uh, in with a new camera, I would certainly feel uncomfortable with that. All right. Last item on the list. And I was debating to put this on, but then I, I, I decided I made an executive decision to put this on. We <laughs> Pop have culture to... dictates. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a tabloid thing, uh, but possibly, but then on the other hand, it's also something that the entire world is talking about, including the photography world. So yeah, um, I, I think it's fair enough to talk about it here. It's also uh, indicative of, of a bigger issue. Exactly. So, so I want to want to briefly talk about the well, briefly. Let's figure this out first <laughs> um, about the doctored Kate Middleton photo. So, um, just a, as a history, because. One or two people listening to this might not have heard of it just yet. So there's Princess Kate. We're talking about the British royals. Um, she's the future queen, and uh, she's a commoner by birth, and she's married to Prince William. And uh, she rose between like like amidst lots of controversies in the in the royal family she was kind of always the the stable one the reliable the one the, the good girl the good, the good girl, girl exactly so <clears throat> um and then she disappeared from the public eye a while ago which is kind of unusual um and uh because the I, the press wants to know and the people want to know and um and uh, uh, th and then there was uh, uh, some communication about her needing some surgery, and I don't know what is going on. No one knows. Lots of speculation. The Spanish press had a speculation about her being in a coma and <laughs> stuff like that. And whatever it is, and um, <clears throat> and uh, then they released, or the palace released. One of the two palaces, because there are two, I just learned that, um, released a photo, a family photo, um, to counteract the rumors, which was then found out, quickly found out, was very poorly manipulated. We're talking now, about bad We should describe the picture. Ads. We should describe the picture. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's Kate Middleton with three kids, I think, and... A very like happy looking family. Everyone is smiling, and uh, um, 
and and then if you look closer, you see weird edges of of, of garments and uh, zippers, weird, <laughs> weird things, zippers disappearing. Badly doctored. Looking. Very. It's, it is doctored. doctored. Um, I've I've seen like. I don't know. It was hard to hard to ignore um, pictures with lots of circles on on them showing where it was manipulated in which way. Anyway, uh, what 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 made things worse is that the major news agencies issued a kill notice, which is uh, something that they send out to the press a couple of times a year, maybe a handful of times a year, very rarely, to take a picture down, to not publish it any further to take it off their websites and so on because of that manipulation. So it's commonly, by the way, Chris, it's commonly used in in contractual discussions with actors in terms of publicity, where they will have a chance to look at the publicity photos that have been taken over the course right. of filming and uh, be able to quote, kill, uh, unquote, um, many of the pictures, and you often will find an actor sitting in <laughs> their trailer with a marker <laughs> just crossing off images that will not and cannot be used for publicity. So uh, the, that... A lot of the, media control being executed there. Okay, yes. Um, Even the, though I've, I find the term kill notice very <laughs> unfortunate in this context. Yeah, it sounds like a Netflix film. But um, the, the, the interesting thing both in terms of the you know the kind of odd narrative of a releasing such a picture and the kill notice that was issued subsequently is the way that the picture caught fire in the mem universe oh and, very quickly super um, quickly yes like almost overnight people were substituting all kinds of weird <laughs> pictures of a, their own families or teddy bears and you know where kate's uh, face would be and you know oh, someone I mean, someone posted posted a madame tussauds a photo <laughs> of very badly made wax figurines of the royal family for, uh, yeah Mm -hmm. I mean, en enough for a museum show of pop culture mimetics vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, imagery, imagery. And, and uh, I find that this is a very specific um, notion to our, er you know, our era. That, that I mean, there was one uh, several years ago, I think, during the inauguration of Biden, of Bernie Sanders sitting with his gloves on. Oh, the woolly gloves. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course, of course. Everyone has seen that millions uh, of times. Yeah. You know, and, and that people have used that picture, you know, hundreds of thousands of times. Yes. And, and yes. so there is a book to be published on this stuff, uh, you so, know. I th I think one of the things is, of course, um, a, a general a discussion about media relations, media cre credibility in in today's day and age, um, the power of images in like shaping narratives, and how that seems to be crumbling. Right? It does. I mean, we we have forensic ways now to dis discover e even slight shifts in noise patterns in pictures to identify where something has been doctored in which way. Um, there's AI, of course. This is not an AI photo or an AI edit for sure. That is uh, still obvious, but might not be as obvious in five years from now. I think AI would before. have done a better job, but possibly <laughs> um we we have we have a lot of things to discuss around like the ethics of image editing related to public relations um and of course in general with uh, several elections around the globe coming up um about transparency versus misinformation but this has been happening for a while i mean often we have um, had photoshop for a long time yeah but uh, you know um you know fashion models for example or actors uh, oh, yeah. some have spoken out you know uh, they've gone in for a cover shoot say to a fashion magazine and uh, have noticed when the cover comes out that they are slenderer, you know, their faces are more perfect, um, the shading, the makeup, all of that. And some actors uh, go, well, yeah, I look great. It's fabulous. Others are very upset about it. They mm -hmm. said, that is not me. I do not look like that. I want me to be me. And I certainly am behind that. I, I, I think that there is a insidious 
um, there's an insidious aesthetic that is very um, works its way through the culture to influence, especially young girls. And, and we are not necessarily just talking about still photos. We're talking about yeah. those filters being available uh, in 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 live video now, where your eyes are slightly little bit bigger and your skin is a bit sure. less. Now it's one thing if you are creating an iconic character and and are adjusting it to reveal or express that character's visual sense or or presentation. It's another thing if you are presenting that as a quote true unquote version of yourself. And that's where it gets very very dodgy. In other words, what am I looking at? Why am I looking at it? Um is this real or not? Now, I I speak because my own work is very much in that gray zone. Um but it it's not about humans. Well, that, but uh, that is that is that is in general what we what we call movie magic. Yeah, but I'm I'm not even talking about movies. I'm talking about my still oh, the photography, imagery. Okay. Yeah, my still image imagery, which is increasingly using AI and other tools to create a you know um, an aesthetic of nostalgia. Yes, but but you want to tell a story, and uh, it's an artistic endeavor. Whereas yeah. um, the royal family. <laughs> wants to wants to dispel rumors of someone being in a coma by and a creates photo. An even that's worse a different <laughs> that's a completely different thing. Yes. They create a worse rumor. <laughs> well, Kate issued an apology, apparently. So so that's the next question. She issued an apology or an apology was issued in her name for like the bad editing. And she said, like, uh, uh, as a mother, I like to edit pictures and I did a bad job and so on. Without any further communication after that, and I'm just trying to figure out, is that even believable that a royal highness isn't being like, would, would, you, would you envision a, a future queen to sit at her desk mm. doing Photoshop, uh, copy paste, uh, clone stamp kind of work on pictures of her? Kids, I have or a hard time believing, or, or herself. herself, I have a hard time believing that. Yeah, uh, and and to what end? Uh, that's really what you're saying. In other words, why? Why did they release this picture? Um, wouldn't it be? Wouldn't it have touched people more? Even if if she had a rough time during surgery, she has no makeup. She's in her room. She's recovering. You know what I mean. A candid photo would have gone so of much course. more <laughs> to to create a bond between her people and, and her rather than presenting this false, phony um, presentation. That I, think, I think we're looking at a complete, not, not just a communications disconnect, but a a cultural disconnect. I mean, they, I, I, I would say the royals probably haven't been very connected anyway but this is <laughs> this is just a different level of disconnectedness so well, that's true that's true anyway uh with that i <laughs> i think we've covered uh, the most uh, pressing most important news items of the week and you, uh let's move on to our picks of the week you have brought us uh what is that? An well, article, a it's gallery? A little, yeah, it's an article and a um, inspiration um, of a photographer. Uh, well worth <clears throat> well worth examining um, of how one uses sort of, I guess uh, you know, nineteenth century painting, photography, uh, technology to create something that is, to my eye, very unique, very beautiful. Um, it's and, a it's a tent image camera and projection and things. It's a yeah. It, this is a, it's aesthetic. like pinhole photography. I mean, that's basically you know in a nutshell. Um, I have a friend who who knows Morel and he he's worked um, often. You know, Morel. Yeah, really interesting photographer. And this is just a small sample of his work, but it is um, it's very unique. Uh, I don't know any. Buddy who who works in this way um, and is well worth exploring. 
Uh, totally. I'm just I'm just looking at these pictures and and the, just the way this the 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 surroundings are used as a as a texture in yeah projected images. It's pinhole yeah, projected not, I, stuff. Yeah, I don't. They're they're not really uh, what I. They're not digital images. They're not, no, they're not. They're, you know, that's what oh, this is awesome. So I like this. Yeah. <clears throat> I like yeah. this. Really beautiful. So I have I've brought us a little uh, technical excursion into an, a different kind of photography, and that is um, uh, scanning electron microscope. So that like is that. a technology that takes pictures by using electron beams, and they are usually used in microscopes, as in very fine structures can be resolved, like bacteria size and smaller. And uh, <clears throat> what these, what, what someone has done is they have taken a spherical plastic sphere, a, a little plastic sphere, and covered that, like charged it with a 20 kilovolt beam, and and used that as a mirror, as an electron mirror inside the electron microscope. So what you see is selfie photography as is a selfie of an electron microscope. So um, what we're looking at is the inside of an electron microscope taken by the electron microscope. I was not aware that it's possible to use an electron microscope to take actual photos of its surroundings, but this is the chamber of the electron microscope, and then they, they go into some more details of some uh, uh, parts of what's in there in that chamber. And um, these are all pictures that have been taken by an electron microscope. <laughs> that, that's These are very, very impressive. I had no idea that it Me would create such realistic, right? Me neither. Uh, images. So, so the, yeah. the the beam the beam normally comes from the top down. So, uh, like if if you're watching video, you see the the electron beam cannon right at the top. It's looking from the bottom up, and uh, and then it it's being it's been focused by electron lenses, as in not glass, but they are they are magnetic fields. Um, and then uh, yeah, this is just. Being ele electrons being shot at a mirror and then caught by the inside of the chamber, I was completely blown away by that because it it just it just turned part of my reality upside down, literally. Wow! What's isn't next? That, <laughs> isn't that great? Next. So oh, that's awesome. I yeah, but it's I think it's only possible inside that chamber because it needs a vacuum and it needs yeah. the, usual. the usual, <laughs> the usual. So, but um. Yeah, an electron microscope taking a picture of something bigger, as in itself. Well, that's the news. That's our news for today. Um, again, next week, we are very likely going to have a bit of a rundown on what Adrian found at the photography show. Um, can't wait for that. He promised to do some recordings for us, so we might have some, some, some talking people. Some, someone else other than us um, other than that I think yeah that covers it we are the future of photography you can find us at the future of photography.com you can find us online uh, join our discord for discussions uh, the link is in the show notes and on the screen and um, yeah that's it for today everyone take care thank you and bye bye You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Thank you.